Can you see the screen? Yes. Okay. So then it looks like it's time to start. Uh, good morning. My name is Andreas Hemmerich from the Institute of Laser Physics at Hamburg University. Um, I thank the organizers uh, for having me here and uh, for putting uh, together uh, such an interesting uh, event. Um, my talk will be on breaking of time translation symmetry and robust period doubling dynamics in a driven open atom cavity system. And I will ask myself uh, whether uh, <clears throat> this should be called a discrete dissipative time crystal. I want to start uh, with introducing uh, to you uh, the team uh, whose work I'm uh, reporting here about. Uh, there's an experimental team in Hamburg with um, a senior postdoc Hans Kessler and two graduate students, Christoph Georges and Fatiman Konkambut. And we have theory support, uh, very nice uh, here in the Institute uh, by the group uh, led by Ludwig Matai with two graduate students, Jim Skulte and Guido Hohmann. And uh, the theory team is uh, enhanced uh, by a former postdoc at Ludwig, uh, Jason Cosme, who is uh, since uh, a couple of months, uh, a professor at the University of the Philippines. Well, if you um, Google uh, the term time crystal, then um, basically you can get around uh, this nature paper uh, 2017, the quest to crystallize time, bizarre forms of matter called time crystals were supposed to be physically impossible, now they are not. And this comes together with a pretty bizarre picture uh, that uh, also Frank Wilczek was showing in his uh, uh, colloquium yesterday. Um, <clears throat> and uh, even if you compare that uh, to uh, uh, things like uh, the little green thing uh, in the lower right corner, uh, which is a time crystal uh, from the TV series Star Trek. Uh, it's still pretty bizarre, uh, this picture. Uh, and uh, the Nature article comes uh, with a quote uh, that I have written up here saying, this is an intriguing development, but to some extent it's an abuse of the term. Uh, and that kind of signals to me uh, that there is an open debate uh, on what a time crystal really uh, has, has to be uh, until today. And uh, it may not be wise uh, to di diversify uh, this term uh, in that situation, but this is exactly uh, what I'm trying to do here, uh, uh, talking about discrete dissipative time crystals. So I want to spend uh, two transparencies uh, to explain what I mean by that. And I'm starting uh, with the original proposal uh, by Frank Wilczek, uh, which is uh, simply uh, a closed system in its ground state or in thermal equilibrium uh, that provides a, an observable that oscillates. And this is indeed a, an intriguing uh, scenario. However, unfortunately, a theory has told us uh, immediately uh, that it is un uh, impossible. And uh, in a, in a kind of a, an action to rescue uh, the, uh, the idea of time crystals, uh, uh, people have added AC drives uh, to, to their systems, uh, such that after an initial switch on phase, uh, there's zero energy transfer if averaged over a driving period. And if then uh, the system uh, offers an observable uh, that oscillates at a frequency different from integer multiples of the driving frequency, um, you have a discrete uh, breaking of time translation symmetry and uh, it has been called a discrete time crystal. And um, one of the difficulties, uh, uh, particularly in experiments, is to prevent undesired dissipation that could destabilize uh, this oscillation. Uh, there have been uh, first experimental realizations. Uh, sorry, this was a bit too fast. Um, uh, there's one uh, uh, by the Maryland group and one by the Harvard group in 2017, and, and uh, some others have, uh, have come later. 
So uh, what I want to do is I want to add a bath uh, to the system such that now there is net energy transfer uh, from the drive uh, to the system uh, to the bath. Uh, however, in a fashion uh, that no entropy is generated. And again, there's an observable of the system uh, that oscillates at a frequency different from the integer multiple of the driving frequency. And uh, by engineering dissipation, uh, one can stabilize uh, this oscillation. And that's what I want to call a discrete dissipative time crystal. And you can take this uh, a little further, uh, or uh, if you want, uh, a little closer uh, to the original proposal by Frank Wilczek uh, by replacing the AC drive uh, by a DC drive. Still, you have net energy transfer from the drive to the bath, uh, no entropy generated. <clears throat> And uh, the system uh, then oscillates uh, with a system inherent frequency. And again, you have to engineer your dissipation uh, to stabilize this oscillation. And then uh, one could call that a continuous dissipative time crystal. There are deliverables uh, that um, um, people ask for if you talk about uh, time crystals. And I will try to show uh, for most of them uh, that uh, they are in place uh, for our system. This is uh, robustness against noise of drive, uh, thermal and quantum noise of the system. And typically uh, one expects uh, that uh, time crystal dynamics occurs by interaction and do spontaneous symmetry breaking. And there's a ongoing discussion on how many body uh, a system should be uh, to call it a time crystal, how many modes that should be allowed uh, for uh, uh, describing the system uh, and also how quantum uh, uh, is the system. Uh, that's also a question I sometimes ask. <clears throat> Our system is composed of atoms and photons in an optical cavity where the atoms act to shape the photon state and the photons uh, act back to shape the atomic state. And if you want uh, the role of the cavity in a few words uh, can be <clears throat> uh, specified uh, by saying that the photon storage increases uh, the atom light coupling. Uh, there's multiple scattering of photons uh, mediating interaction between the atoms. Uh, and uh, yeah, in our specific system, the cavity allows for very long times between subsequent sc uh, scattering processes uh, because the lifetime of the photons uh, uh, bouncing back and forward between the mirrors uh, is extremely large in our system. So in a many body viewpoint in our systems, uh, the interaction mediated by the photons uh, is not only infinite range, uh, but it is retarded infinite range <clears throat> uh, due to the long lifetime of the photons in the, in the cavity. And here I want to show you, uh, this is not working well. Here I want to show you uh, our cavity at Hamburg uh, <clears throat> in a more experimental physics type uh, uh, aspect. Um, I basically uh, want to uh, focus on these two numbers. Uh, the bandwidth is 4.5 kilohertz, uh, uh, which is uh, pretty much the same as the recoil frequency. And uh, this shows you uh, that there are similarly long time scales uh, for the temporal evolution of the light field, the photon field on one side and the matter field, the atoms on the other side. Uh, and that uh, once more uh, points at the uh, circumstance uh, that I mentioned before uh, that the photons mediate a retarded infinite range interaction between the atoms. Now, uh, the uh, atoms have to be fed with photons uh, to get photons into the cavity. And this is done by coupling the atoms uh, to a standing wave uh, that's oriented uh, perpendicularly uh, to the cavity axis, as I'm showing here uh, in, this, uh, in this little sketch. Uh, and for this system already in an early paper, um, very insightful, uh, Peter Domokos and Helmut Rich have predicted that this should lead to a self-organization phase transition. And only a year later, uh, it, this uh, self-organization phase transition has been observed uh, uh, by the group of uh, Vladimir Bulicic in 2003 with thermal atoms. Uh, and uh, then uh, uh, quite a few years later, there has been an important paper uh, by Tilman Essling, Esslinger's group uh, where they uh, demonstrated uh, this uh, self-organization phase transition for the first time uh, with both condensed atoms. And they were arguing uh, that uh, in this case, uh, the phase transition is uh, equivalent to the Hebb-Leib phase transition in the open decomposition. 
So what are the signatures of this uh, decay phase transition uh, as, uh, as I call it now? Uh, <clears throat> let's uh, start on the, uh, on the left panel here. Uh, this is a situation now that I address as the normal phase. Uh, when the atoms are coupled to a standing, uh, standing wave, the pump wave, uh, but uh, scattering of photons uh, into the resonator is not possible. And this is uh, understandable uh, if you, uh, well, um, realize uh, that for every atom uh, that in principle could scatter a photon uh, onto the cavity axis, there is another atom, uh, half an optical wavelength away along the Z direction that would also scatter, however, with exactly opposite phase. And uh, because of that, uh, destructive interference uh, prevents uh, effective scattering. Uh, this comes uh, with the characteristic uh, momentum spectrum uh, that uh, one can look at in experiments. Uh, <clears throat> this is uh, uh, this, these two black, uh, these, these three black dots here. Uh, in the middle, uh, you have the uh, k equals zero component. Uh, this is the BC component. And because of the coupling to the pump standing wave, uh, you have two uh, higher order Bragg peaks uh, at plus minus two h bar k. And now if you crank up the power uh, <clears throat> above a critical value, uh, then the atoms uh, self-organize uh, into a Bragg grading that very efficiently allows uh, scattering uh, because now the Bragg condition is fulfilled, no destructive interference anymore. And if that happens, uh, uh, you get an intense light field in, in the cavity, uh, which you can look at experimentally uh, by just looking about looking at the photons leaking out of the cavity up here. And uh, <clears throat> uh, there is a characteristic momentum spectrum um, associated uh, with that situation uh, where you have extra Bragg peaks uh, here and here. Uh, that signal uh, that you have a standing wave uh, established in the cavity along the cavity axis. And this uh, is what I uh, denote as the density wave phase, uh, where you have uh, uh, a matter grating uh, in your cavity uh, stabilized uh, by an intercavity light field. Now, as I said before, the many body perspective uh, uh, photon mediated retarding long range interaction between the atoms uh, is. Uh, in place here, and this is uh, what leads to this phase transition. And uh, one can see that uh, there's in fact uh, a retardation uh, if you cross uh, uh, the phase boundary. Uh, and this is shown in this uh, um, experimental plot uh, where the blue curve uh, uh, sort of starts in the normal phase. Uh, there's no light uh, in the cavity here. Uh, I'm plotting uh, the intensity, intracavity intensity on the y-axis. And you see as you cross uh, the equilibrium phase boundary, uh, this is this gray bar here, nothing happens. A uh, system uh, is not yet, uh, has not yet realized uh, that it should uh, produce a density wave state now. But uh, if you further go in, at some point, uh, the system does realize that uh, and uh, you are establishing uh, uh, a strong uh, intracavity light field uh, together with the matter wave grading. Uh, and on the way back, uh, this is the uh, red curve uh, tuning out of the DW phase again. Uh, at some point you're crossing the phase transition boundary and end up back in the normal phase. And you can look at the different characteristic Bragg spectra, uh, momentum spectra with the uh, different kinds of Bragg peaks uh, that I was discussing before. Uh, for instance, as you go in here at this point, uh, you still have no intracavity field. Uh, so you get this kind of uh, momentum spectrum. Whereas uh, once uh, you're establishing an intracavity field, you see these additional black peaks. Uh, and after you go all the way around uh, and uh, you're back in the normal phase, uh, you're back uh, to both condensate with a few buggy of excitation on top. Okay, uh, so that is uh, um, a way uh, to see uh, that uh, the response is retarded here. And now there's also a spontaneous breaking of the two symmetry uh, associated uh, with this phase transition. Uh, and this is due to the fact that, that there are two gradings uh, possible that both uh, make the Bragg condition uh, work uh, for efficient scattering. Uh, 
And these two uh, cases uh, differ by the fact that, that these lattices, these intracavity uh, metal gratings are shifted with respect to each other by half an optical wavelength. And this can be seen uh, by looking at the light leaking out of the cavity here because uh, uh, there's a different phase uh, between uh, the outcoming photons here and the pump wave for the two cases. Uh, and uh, it's easy to understand uh, that uh, the difference in the phase uh, is simply pi. Uh, and that can be looked at uh, by a heterodyne uh, uh, detector. And this is what I'm showing you here. So uh, here at the beginning, uh, we are in the density wave phase. You see the red curve here, the red data uh, shows the intracavity light. Uh, so there is a light field in the cavity and you see uh, that uh, this is a heterodyne, heterodyne phase detection uh, signal. Uh, you see uh, the phase of that light uh, that uh, leaks out of the cavity is zero. And uh, then uh, we are going out of the uh, density wave phase back to the normal phase by ramping down uh, the pump strengths and return back uh, going into the density wave phase again. And again, uh, we get light in the cavity. And again, uh, you see the phase uh, uh, is simply zero. But uh, in other uh, occasions, uh, uh, something else happens. Uh, you start again uh, with zero phase. And you end up, uh, if you go in the second time, uh, uh, with a situation where the phase is pi. So you see uh, there are two kinds of cases and you can uh, make uh, lots of measurements uh, and uh, finally uh, put together a histogram uh, for the two cases. And this is what you see then uh, in, in, uh, in uh, the sketch D here, uh, where uh, you have a nearly 50% uh, probability to be in one or the other case. So now how to prepare a discrete time crystal uh, a discrete dissipative time crystal, actually. Well, uh, we apply amplitude modulation of uh, uh, the pump uh, in the density wave phase. Uh, so the drive is modulated uh, in this fashion. Uh, there's two uh, parameters, uh, the modulation index at naught and the frequency uh, omega d, uh, which is in the range of a couple of kilohertz. So then this is, uh, sorry. This is the center plot uh, that I can show you. Uh, uh, what I'm showing you here is uh, we are ramping up uh, the strengths of the pump wave uh, in order uh, to get into the density wave phase. This is happening here. And you see, once you cross uh, the dashed line, uh, you get power in the cavity. Uh, there's light leaking out of the cavity that you can detect. And uh, the phase detector, uh, the heterodyne detector uh, shows that the, this is the case when the phase is zero. And then at this point, the modulation is turned on. Uh, and what you see is uh, that there is an uh, oscillation of the cavity intensity that goes to some maximal values and then all the way to zero. And uh, again, spiking, uh, as you see here. And this is in phase uh, with uh, 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 the modulation uh, that you apply to the pump. However, uh, as you can see, uh, the blue curve uh, there is the phase signal and that uh, produces a period doubling uh, as you can see. So uh, uh, as you see here uh, for different uh, maxima of the intracavity uh, intensity, uh, you see different phases. Uh, the system oscillates uh, between phase pi and uh, phase zero uh, a couple of times here. And one can also look at the momentum spectra uh, as this happens. Uh, uh, at this point here, uh, you are still without an intracavity field and not yet in the uh, density wave phase. Uh, so the characteristic uh, spectrum of the two Bragg peaks are from the pump wave. Uh, once you're in here, uh, uh, you are in the uh, stationary uh, density wave phase. Uh, you see these Bragg peaks. And now as the system oscillates, you see uh, that, uh, again, in these pictures, uh, that there's a, a period doubling. Uh, you see uh, that uh, the system oscillates between the different uh, uh, um, um, uh, broken symmetry states, if you want, uh, back and forward. Uh, and you can calculate uh, the single particle uh, atomic density uh, according uh, to these Bragg spectra, and you see uh, that uh, for different maxima, for uh, this maximum and this maximum, you see different pictures. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> the system uh, oscillates between the two 
possible metal gradings uh, back and forward. Now, also here, uh, uh, there is obviously a spontaneous breaking of the two symmetry in place. Uh, this can be seen uh, by uh, repeating uh, this uh, protocol. Uh, we are uh, ramping up uh, our uh, pump strengths uh, uh, at a certain point, uh, starting the modulation, uh, and we see our period doubling signal in the, uh, in the phase detector. Uh, and uh, then we are going out of the density wave again. Uh, you see then the phase is completely undetermined, uh, and this is uh, going up and down uh, uh, by 2 pi. Uh, and uh, then we are going back in again, and you see uh, then this happens here for this trace, for this specific trace uh, with uh, the same phase. However, for other implementations, uh, you see uh, this happens uh, with uh, uh, a phase uh, shifted by pi. And again, uh, you could put together uh, a histogram and see uh, that uh, <clears throat> this is nearly a 50 50 uh, situation. Now, <clears throat> what are the dynamical regimes? Uh, basically, uh, this, uh, what I'm showing here on the right side, uh, uh, is a kind of phase diagram uh, uh, with respect uh, to two parameters, uh, uh, the modulation frequency omega d and the modulation strength uh, that we apply. And you see uh, that there is an area where uh, you can see color and the color is simply uh, what you can call uh, the relative crystalline fraction, uh, which is nothing else but the amplitude of the subharmonic peak in the normalized Fourier spectrum of the phase uh, that we uh, record with our homo uh, heterodyne detector. Um, and uh, uh, this is a calculation, a mean field calculation actually uh, uh, by Jason Cosme. Uh, and you see uh, that uh, pretty much at the place uh, where we see the colors here, uh, 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 time crystal phase is predicted uh, by mean field. Okay, uh, so now I want to look a little bit uh, uh, closer uh, to uh, this phase diagram and uh, position myself at this uh, position here where the red cross is. Uh, and you see uh, you're not yet uh, into the, okay, you're not yet into the regime uh, where something happens. Uh, uh, not actually, uh, you simply see uh, a constant phase here uh, and uh, no oscillation uh, at, uh, uh, ha uh, have the frequency, uh, uh, as you can see here uh, from, from, from the spectrum. Now, if we move into the uh, region now uh, where uh, we see color here, uh, things are different. And now we are in this situation, you see uh, the stem oscillates, uh, shows uh, um, a period doubling. And this is as shown in the spectrum uh, where you see uh, a pronounced peak here. Uh, at 0.15. Uh, this is half of the frequency uh, that we are modulating with. Uh, and you can also go on uh, to the other side. And on the other side, you see uh, that now the system oscillates uh, with a higher frequency. You see uh, basically uh, there's some uh, oscillation at omega d. Uh, the period doubling uh, uh, contribution is completely gone. The robustness against uh, driving noise is shown on this slide here. And uh, simply what we're doing is adding noise uh, to the modulation here. And uh, well, this is getting stronger and stronger uh, uh, from A to B to C to D. And if you look at D, uh, this is basically the trace of uh, the modulated uh, uh, time of the modulation uh, applied. Uh, and you, you can practically in, uh, Practically cannot recognize anymore uh, that this is a regular modulation, uh, but still you see uh, the uh, uh, period uh, doubling response here. So uh, very uh, impressive. Uh, this is to us uh, how stable uh, this this uh, dynamics is against uh, adding noise uh, to the drive. Uh, and here we are uh, sort of plotting. Uh, 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 the noise strength on the x-axis, uh, which is uh, simply a measure on, of how much noise we apply. And we look at the crystalline fraction, uh, how much of the period doubling signal uh, do we still see? And you see uh, that uh, we can apply a lot of noise uh, before this is going down. 
Now, finally, uh, <clears throat> I want to show you a, a calculation uh, that uh, has been done uh, by Jason Cosme, uh, who uh, analyzes uh, the oscillation dynamics uh, for different amounts of uh, collisional uh, action and uh, if uh, atom loss is introduced. So uh, the collision uh, uh, energy here, uh, you see is zero for the blue uh, and has some value of 0.08. Uh, recoil energy is for the green and uh, a little larger 0.3 uh, for the red. And uh, in the black uh, trace, uh, there's in addition, a loss rate introduced uh, basically by hands uh, to uh, take care of the fact that, that in the experiment uh, we are losing atoms uh, as, as time evolves. And what you see is uh, that, uh, well, uh, the system uh, can survive uh, quite a bit of uh, uh, quite a bit of uh, contact interaction uh, before it starts to suffer, before the oscillation uh, uh, start, starts to de decohere. And this is seen in the red curve uh, with 0.3 in recoil uh, uh, two body contact interaction. Uh, the system uh, degrades here. And you can also see that uh, even better. And if you want, in the, in the two point uh, uh, correlation function, uh, where you see uh, that after 10 milliseconds uh, for the red curve, uh, the, uh, the correlation completely uh, uh, decoheres. And also, uh, if you add uh, the, uh, the uh, timing uh, for the loss of atoms, uh, uh, pretty much uh, you see the curves that we see in the experiment. So that's it. Uh, uh, I'm at my summary. Uh, and uh, what I've tried to show you is a discrete dissipative time crystal in an atom cavity system. Uh, I've uh, shown you uh, that we have uh, spontaneous time translation with symmetry breaking. Uh, uh, there's period doubling dynamics uh, and the oscillation frequency is robust against system and driving noise. So thank you uh, for your attention. Thank you, Andreas. The talk is open for questions. Ah, uh, uh, Thank you, Andreas, and good to see you again. Um, uh, thank you very much for the nice talk. Uh, I have a question. So in our original proposal of this uh, time-driven Dickey model, uh, we saw three different uh, phases that pop up. There was the standard normal phase, which you also see. There was the super radiant phase that you could also then time modulate and see then starting of, of small limit cycles that would show time uh, periods, a uh, time uh, doubling uh, phase transition, and we we dubbed another phase where you would also expect to see instabilities, but then on average the light is zero there, but you would see that effectively the system processes and shows beating uh, with generation of additional subharmonic frequencies. Uh, would you say that the third phase that you showed would actually correspond to that dynamical normal phase that we uh, predicted? Um, well, that is, that could be, but I cannot make a, a, a clean statement uh, because uh, this, well, this is a situation uh, that's close to a chaotic response in a way, and it's hard to pin down uh, what it really is. Uh, mm -hmm. It's obviously none of the other phases, uh, but uh, this is something uh, that we can, uh, we have to spend more time taking more data to, to really classify uh, what kind of dynamics is happening there. Uh, okay, so I mean, effectively, it was dynamics. corresponding to limit cycles on the right. on the effect, effective Bloch sphere. That was actually, yes. and it's it's generating higher harmonics through the nonlinearity of the of the mm -hmm. spin length conservation and the time dependent drive, yes. which is expected at high driving right. amplitudes. But how how to pin down? Uh, I mean, what, what's the signature uh, that really would pin down uh, that uh, this is uh, the phase uh, that you're talking about? Uh, ah, well, you, you would effectively see uh, in your heterodyne, you would see something very similar. You, you would actually see that your light uh, pulses on and off. Which we are seeing. Uh, only that it's, right. it's, it, it's basically uh, rather at uh, around omega d than omega d over 2. And it is not exactly regular. There's 
Yeah, yeah, you should have a light okay. pulsing with uh, many right. subharmonic generations over there because it effectively makes uh, limit cycles on the block sphere. So it couples mm -hmm. and decouples from the transverse cavity. And therefore, you should see bursts of light with some characteristic frequency appearing over there. Uh, I I, I'll be happy to tell you more about it. it. Huh? Yeah. OK. So I mean. OK. Uh, I think uh, I postponed the other questions. Uh, we have a long break. And uh, uh, maybe we can just uh, uh, those which are interested can follow on in discussion. And I hand over to Rosario. Okay, so um, just to say that we will start again at 11 o'clock. So because unfortunately, the next speaker who was supposed to give a talk is not feeling well. So he had to cancel the talk. And uh, so we resume at 11 uh, with Anna Sampera. All the speakers uh, of the next session that would like to, that did not do it, uh, but would like to test the presentation, we can meet. Uh, say a quarter of an hour before the beginning and uh, we, we can make these checks. Okay, so rest, enjoy the rest and coffee.